Well, Father, we just thank you for this moment together. We thank you for this conference. We thank you, Father, for the word that we've received from Jeremiah, from Rob, from Mark, Father God, from Trisha. Thank you for the way that you flow through those that love to serve you so that those that know that they're loved by you can experience you in a deeper and greater way. I pray that you bless this word, Father God, that you bless the hearer, that, Lord, they would shut every other voice and only listen to yours today. Holy Spirit, have your way during this time right now. You be glorified. You let your agenda completely unfold because you know the needs of the people more than anyone else. So I yield my heart to you that you would use it, Father God, today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Well, when I was getting the message ready um, for t today, this morning, the, I asked the Lord what he want me to bring to his people. And he said to me, Alex, I want to talk about falling from grace. You've heard that term before, oh, that person has fallen from grace. And what ends up happening is that it's used wrongly. Usually they'll say that, that someone has fallen from grace if they see them being disgraced. But the greatest disgrace in the Bible is to not receive grace. If you want to, you know, to use a slang, if you want to diss someone, <laughs> you can diss God by ignoring the work of grace. This was a, a tough problem from the Jewish people because their relationship with the Father was through the law. But now there was a new better way, and that new better way was grace. For us, it's self-condemnation. I'll see people that say, I, I feel unworthy. Why would God do that for me? I feel so unworthy. I feel so unworthy. I want to settle something this morning. We are definitely unworthy. Actually, it says that there was none righteous, not even one. So when we come to the Father, we come to the Father not worthy. I've had, I've had Christians tell me this. Well, Alex, I believe that God forgave all my sins, but after I got saved, I don't believe that if I sin after I get saved that those are covered under the blood. I'm amazed at that confusion that the enemy has planted in the minds of people. You know, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, the demons came to the devil and they said, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? What are we going to do now? The Messiah came and has set them free. And Satan said, don't worry, demons. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to confuse them about their identity. We're going to get them to doubt their Heavenly Father. We're going to get them to doubt their salvation. We're going to inflict sickness on them, hoping that they don't understand that they're the healed, rejecting sickness. But then they'll plead the Father for what already belongs to them, and we'll let them live in confusion as much as we can until somebody comes and brings them the Word of God, tells them the truth, and sets them free. That's where the enemy has the children of God living. Some Christians, they walk around, it looks like they suck lemons in the morning before they got up. And then you invite someone to that Christianity. Ah, oh, you want to receive Jesus? Not if he's going to do to me what he did to you. I don't want that Jesus. If he's going to do to me what he did to you, no, I don't want that. And why are we living that way? We're living that way because we've listened to another voice. And I'm telling you, when you get to the point, it says, my sheep hear my voice, and another they will not follow. We have no business following any other voice than the voice of grace, who is a person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely no business. And when I talk to Christians, you think that they fell from grace. Because for some reason, they believe that God has all the power that he needs to forgive your sins when you're a sinner. But then when you become a son, all of a sudden, God somehow lost his power to forgive you of your sins. So then what do you do? You put back on you 
the vest that brings shame. That brings shame. Most Christians who have fallen into sin after they got saved, the reason, by the way, you fell into sin after you got saved was one reason and one reason only. And that was that you didn't understand that you used to uh, sin by slavery, now you sin by choice. A sinner sins by slavery. He is a slave to sin. He does not have a choice. But a Christian who has been born again created a brand new species. You are not what you were. Now the, the outer body looks the same, but when you were born again, you are created into a brand new species, and that species has no sin. Most Christians that will doubt their salvation, they think, I, I blew it now. I have sinned. Listen, you were born of incorruptible seed. It is impossible for you to corrupt what God has cleansed. Somewhere in your human mind, and, then, and I'll tell you most of the reason that your human mind fails you is because it needs to be renewed to who you are in the spirit. Somewhere in your human mind, you got convinced that you could sin and remove what you did not put in. I got thrown out of a church because I preached this one time. I said, how many of you got saved by your own habits? Nobody raised their hand. I said, okay, that's good. So if your habits didn't bring you salvation, how can your habits take it away? Woo! I got a quick lesson right after the message. Twelve steps how to maintain your salvation. And they went down each one of them. And you know what I had to do? Take those verses. And they used Hebrews chapter 4. You know, oh, you, you're not hanging Jesus on the cross again. I said, who was that written to? Let's put that back into context. And when we did, guess what? The person that was sent to correct me got corrected by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. How can you maintain? You know, I, I love the way that, that Paul had it out with, with Peter in Galatians. Who's bewitched you? If you look at that word, it actually is the word rebel. Why are you rebelling? Because rebellion is like witchcraft. Why are you rebelling against the fact that what you started in the spirit, you cannot maintain in the flesh? So the lie of the devil is to get you to start working on what Christ did at the cross. It's the cross plus zero. If you add something to it, it's no longer grace. Because grace is not what you do, grace is what Christ did. And so when Christians feel that they've fallen away from grace, they feel that they've fallen away from grace because they're no longer maintaining what they received. Can't do it. It's incorruptible seed. I asked the Lord one time, give me a picture of this, please. A word picture. I like word pictures. He said, Alex, if you took a sandwich and sealed it, in a, in, a, in a Ziploc bag, perfectly sealed, and you held it under toilet water. He says, would the toilet water contaminate the sandwich? And I said, no. He said, why? I said, because it's sealed. He said, it doesn't matter how dirty the water outside of that package is. If that package is sealed, whatever it contains has been protected. He said, this is how your spirit has been born again. You were born of me, and that part of me is holy. You cannot contaminate it. The body cannot contaminate what the spirit has sealed. That's the beauty of this salvation. It's eternal. 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 He didn't say it was salvation. He called it eternal salvation. So what happens with grace when we think we've fallen from grace? I'm going to teach you today what it really means to have fallen from grace. Rob stole my message, by the way, the first time I ever preached. I said, oh, use that one, oh, use that one. Use, I don't know what I'm going to do now, Jesus. He used them all. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was all right. No, next time I'm going to ask that I go first. That's what I'm, you know. So hopefully I'll use all the ones you're using next time. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5. And let's go to verse 1.
And it says in verse 1 of chapter 5, though I got a clock up there, just want to make sure that I don't go over. But it tells us here, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. What's your job? Stand. You guys want to work at this? Just stand. You know, some of you, you know, because you, you want to measure your performance. So once I ask God, well, why do we work so hard at Christianity? He says, because humans want to measure the performance that Christ did for them at the cross. But that, you know, if God pays, you know, the dinner, we want to leave the tip. Lord, just let me do something, just yeah. anything, just, just a little bit. You know why? Because we want to work for what Christ did. And so it, all we have to do is stand. It's too simple. It's the simple gospel. You just stand. You stand in the finished work of Christ, and it's liberty. It is freeing. It is freeing. You know, I'm staying with some friends while I'm here. They won't let me do anything. I get up, they've made breakfast. When I come back, my bed is made. Embarrassing, but she did my laundry, which means she did all my underclothes, <laughs> folded it up. It's embarrassing. But they won't let me do a thing. I wanted to rent a car. No, you're taking our car. I mean, it's just nothing. So you know what I was able to do? Just enjoy my time there. You know what Christ did? He did everything for you. Honey, stop working, please. Put down that mantle of work so that you can tell Christ, look at I, I was responsible with what you did. You want to be responsible with Christ? Enjoy your salvation. Amen? Just enjoy what he's done. And he's asking us here in that liberty just to stand where Christ has made us free. And do not entangle again with the yoke of bondage. What yoke of bondage is that? The yoke of works. The yoke of works. See, they used to measure their relationship with God by what they did. So if they got up and prayed an hour in the morning, you remember that false religion that Jesus gave that example where he said, here was a tax collector and he's beating his chest. Father, forgive me. And then here comes the man who thinks he's self-righteous. And what does he say? He prays, he fasts two days a week, he goes down the list of everything that he did, yet the tax collector was at the mercy of what Christ did. Listen to me, don't come beating your chest. Don't come to the Lord beating your chest. Here's what I, I did. Always go into the mercy of what Christ did. Because if you want to experience the love of God, the love of God covered you completely. The only thing left for you to do, you want to work at something? Read the Bible and renew your mind to what your spirit already knows. It's true. By yourself, with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, you have the Trinity. You do, because there's three parts to you. And those three parts, when they all line up with the Word of God, that is the Trinity flowing through you. All, you use your hands to heal. You use your mind to sing Him songs, praise Him, and learn about Him. And then you use your spirit to worship Him. And that's why we pray in the Spirit. It's a simple formula. It requires no effort whatsoever. It just requires time. It just requires time. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I remember one, t one time sharing with God that I, I didn't have time to do something. And he quickly pointed out to me, you know, when your favorite movie comes out, <laughs> somehow you seem to find two hours to sit down, and, but no one better interrupt you while you're watching it. Okay? He says, so guess what? You have time. What you need are priorities. Priorities to what? To walk in that liberty. Guys, we need to walk in that liberty. There's some people that when they've come to me and they've asked me questions, within five minutes I know if they read the word or if they don't. Because they really don't believe that it works. If you are not speaking, you are not creating. How did God start this earth? By speaking. That's how he created. Guess 
how his children that, oh, by the way, were created in his image perform. They perform by speaking. You know, today we got a lot of word, praise God. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, you know, after Trish spoke, a um, couple of people have asked me, so I'm going to cover a few things quickly on healing. How is it that we are actually healed? Because I want to impart knowledge to you so you understand that healing does not come through this preacher. Healing comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a pattern for healing, so we'll cover that later. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, that if you become circumcised, and here he was talking to the Christians who were being told by the Jews, oh, no, 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 you receive Christ, but you also must be circumcised. God is looking for a circumcision. He is, but it's a circumcision of your heart. And he's the one, when you receive Christ, that performs it in your heart. It's not by the hands of man. It's by the hands of your creator. It's no longer a physical circumcision. And he wants to circumcise your heart from, you know what, dead works, unbelief, and questions about his character. You cannot receive something when you're busy questioning the character of the person doing it. You can't. And you won't trust. You know, you get a mechanic to come and fix your car and he shows up with the book. And he starts looking at the part and looking through the book and reading on how to fix it. You'll be out of there in about five minutes. It's okay, junior cadet, I'm out of here. So why does that happen? Because you don't trust someone that you know that cannot back up what they say. Today's gospel can't be just a gospel. It's got to be the gospel followed by the power. If you deny the power thereof, then you'll try to add your own generator. Too many churches today adding their own generator because they've denied the power thereof. But if you believe that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and you allow that power to flow, you won't be adding your own. I don't get any results when I do it on my own. I only get results when God does it through me. That's the best way to get results. And he lives in me. Where? Christ in me, the hope of glory. He's living in your spirit. You have the full power of the deity living in you. Jesse Duplantis, who was taken to heaven, cracked me up because he said when he got up there, he was talking to the angel, and he says, all right, and he's seen the Father, he's seen the Son. He goes, where's the Holy Spirit? And the angel says, oh, he's on earth. I knew that. Jesse yeah. says, I, I, I knew that. I knew. Yeah, stupid question. He's going, I can't believe I asked it. Where is he? He's in us. The third part of the Trinity is in you, and that represents Christ in you. I love Philip's question. Jesus, just show us the Father. Just show us the Father. And Jesus, knowing that he was the express image of the Father, said to him, Philip, I've been with you all this time, and yet you do not know me? Guys, when people see you, they should see the Father. When they see you, they should see Jesus. When they see you, they should see the Holy Spirit. When they see you, they should see every answer that Christ has for them. But you know when they will see it in you? When you see it in yourself first. You have to see it in yourself first. You have to believe it for yourself first. When you have faith for yourself first, that you were chosen, before the foundation of the earth, he chose you. He loved you. He separated you unto himself. When you believe that, then you begin to operate in the power, not that comes from you, but comes through you by the Holy Spirit. And then you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And then you'll turn situations around. Why? Because you're at rest, that it's not by your works, but it's by Christ's. Amen? Christ will profit you nothing if you try by yourself. And look at what it says here. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You guys know that the law wasn't there for us to keep it. The law was there to prove that you couldn't keep it. As a matter of fact, if we were to go right now into uh, Hebrews chapter 8, one of my favorite verses. And it says, this is the problem with the original covenant. It found fault with you. 
That's what it says about the original covenant. See, it was supposed to be a schoolmaster, but what it ended up doing was finding fault with you. Most people that are under law, you know how they look? In shame and condemned. Because they're under the law and they can't keep it. They've tried. I mean, they've tried honestly with their whole heart and they can't keep it. And then what do they get? They get shame. And after they get shame, they feel like they're at fault. Isn't it interesting that in the New Covenant, Pontius Pilate is washing his hands and what word comes out of his mouth? I find no fault in this man. See, God knew I need a faultless man to take the fault from humanity and I can put it on that man and then I could remove it from humanity. That's love. So you have to understand what, what you walk in. You are not at fault. Not because you didn't do wrong, but because your wrong was put on the back and on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. God didn't forget about your sins because he had a mental lapse. Like you forget where you put your keys in the morning. I thought I put them here. I must put. God didn't like forget where he dropped off your sins. Out of an act of will, out of an act of his will, he's chosen not to remember your sins no more. That's the covenant we're in. But if we try to keep it, just a little part of it, what, what are we guilty of? The entire law. You got to keep the whole thing. It says, you have become an, uh, estranged from Christ. You who tempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. So what does fallen from grace mean? It means that any time that you try to approach the Father by any other name that isn't the name of Jesus Christ, what you have done is that you have become estranged to what he's done for you. And that is what the Word of God calls fallen from grace. Now, I don't know about you. I've been guilty of that. I said, man, you know what? I've done that. I've tried to get it right. I've tried to do it right. No wonder. I feel the more that I try, the further I feel from Christ. Why? Because I'm trying to duplicate the efforts of the cross with human effort. And that human effort will never accomplish the spiritual things of God. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything, but faith works through love. Now I want to tell you something. There was a time when I attempted to have faith without love. And you know what I found myself? Putting faith above Christ. I started to believe in faith more than in Jesus Christ. And when I did that, I found myself under the law of faith. And I couldn't believe that. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, what, what just happened? What just happened? Because I thought that what I, the missing element was faith. So I put faith on a pedestal and put Christ on the side. And then I was trying to accomplish things not through the faith of God, but I was trying to accomplish things through the faith of Alex. It was the faith. Hey, brother, what do you... What, and you know what? Famous thing we ask another brother. What do you believe in God for today? You know what we're saying? What are you exercising your faith on? Listen, if it's not the faith of God through love, that can become a work. And so when the Lord was showing me about falling from grace, he goes, here's another thing you need to do. Alex, you need faith. But you need the faith of God, not your own faith. Your faith can't be separated from God. And then your faith has to come through love. I have faith in the love of my mother. I have faith in the love of my wife. I have faith in the love of my children. And you know what that faith brings me? Comfort. But when I started to work out on faith without love, that faith all of a sudden became a burden that I could not achieve. Because when something would go wrong, first thing the devil would accuse me of, you didn't have faith. Yep, that's why your child's sick, you didn't have faith. Yep, that's why you're walking around with that sickness, because you didn't have faith. You didn't have faith. And then the very thing that was meant to bring me life, you know what it did? 
It brought me condemnation. I have failed God because I didn't have enough faith. But when I realized that the faith that he's talking about here is not the faith that I generate, but the faith that he generated for me, then it became easy because the one that took my burdens on the cross took the burden of making that faith come to pass. Oh, man, was that freeing. I thought, my God, why didn't I hear this before? Guys, it was a time, man, I was just, I was so faith-bound. Christ wasn't in it. Love wasn't in it. it was, I was working it. You know what I mean? I was rowing every morning that faith. Woo! Today I'm just going to have faith. Just going to have faith. No, you don't want faith without the author and the finisher of your faith. And when you have the author and the finisher of your faith working it, guess what happens? All of a sudden it flows through love. I have faith in the love of God. And the love of God expressed is Jesus Christ. And when I had faith in the express love of God, then I started to experience the liberty of faith. Faith has a reward when it comes from the Father and it's full of love. Mushy love. Mushy, mushy, mushy love. I'm telling you. It's, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. It's mushy, beautiful love. And it comes from the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the living God. Praise the King of Kings. Romans 3.20 through 24. Again, Rob taking all my verses here. I was like, what? No. I love this. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 24. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. You know, I met a guy, he would not give up law. He goes, I don't care what you say, Pastor. And I mean, I, was, I do life coaching. I was life coaching a guy from the NFL. And he, because he was successful in the NFL, and the only reason he was successful was because he worked it. He worked his body. He worked the patterns. He worked everything that he had to do. And so he had a hard time believing that you could have any faith in God without law. And I remember praying and praying and praying and praying. And I said, God, could you give me some law for this man? <laughs> I said, because, I mean, faith ain't going to work it. I, I tried the grace angle. The grace angle wouldn't work it. I said, how do I bring him through faith in Christ, in the work of grace, but by law? And God answered me. And when I seen it, I was like, wow. That's actually powerful. So he took me to Romans chapter 8. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to turn around and read it with you guys. I love this, by the way. I just have to get this Holy Ghost interruption in, guys. This is not a much a rabbit trail as it is, just God. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You guys remember the message from yesterday? that Jesus unzipped himself, and we walked in, and he zipped himself back up. I gave the example, if I tried to shoot a basketball like Michael Jordan, you all know it ain't going to happen. But if Michael Jordan can unzip himself, and I could have stand inside of Michael Jordan, and then he would zip himself back up, I can throw a basketball exactly like Michael Jordan. You know why you can do all things in Christ Jesus? Because that's where you are located. You're located in Christ Jesus. So I love this verse who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Go to the next verse. For the law. I said, hallelujah. He loved this. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I said, see, sin and death, that law came in and cursed you, but the higher court released the law that declared you completely free. You know, for him, that was the law that did it. He goes, hallelujah. I said hallelujah when I seen it because there's some people that are just going to be law-minded. Doesn't matter how much grace you teach them, they're going to be law-minded. So how wonderful is God to show us that the higher court had a greater law that said that you have been set free from the law of sin and the law of death. 
I don't know about you, but if a law came out that I no longer had to pay taxes, I would laugh at that bill when it showed up. <laughs> I'd be looking at that bill go, that ain't going to happen anymore. Why? Because I'd be freed from that. Let me tell you something. You have to acknowledge what grace did for you. It freed you from the law of sin and death. And now you, if you want to live under law, go ahead, but make sure it's the law of life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So rereading again, verse 20. Therefore, Romans 3.20, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. All that the law does is breed sin. If you want to know if there are going to be mosquitoes around anywhere where there's a puddle, mosquitoes are going to nest. You want to, I, we could right now, in a Petri dish called law, birth sin at any time. If I walk into a church and I go to minister and it's a law church, I already know everybody's under sin. Because... If you read Romans chapter 7, you will see how clearly it describes that where there is law, it gives life to sin. It just does. You want to give life to sin? Law. Most people that are under condemnation, they're under condemnation because somewhere in their life, there's some law. A little leaven, leavens the whole lump. All you need is a little bit of law. But brother, you know, if, if we start teaching that, maybe people will start sinning that there's no longer law. I hear that a lot all the time. And I, my, my answer stays the same. You will sin without knowing Jesus when you were under no law. How do you think that grace is the permission to sin? Grace is the empowerment to live holy. You want a definition for grace? It's the empowerment to live holy. Because I'm going to tell you where sin died. It died at the cross. It's the empowerment to live holy. Hallelujah. Glory be to the Lamb. Glory be to the Lamb. Hallelujah. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testified. The object that the law and the prophets testified about was Jesus. Hallelujah. Did you realize that they never testified about themselves? They testified about how inadequate you were without Jesus. It was a schoolmaster. You know what my favorite day in school was? Graduation. I don't know about you all. Man, when I found out I was going to graduate, I loved it because I knew it's the end. <laughs> Listen, could you all graduate from the school of law and finally walk into the law of grace? Just graduate today. Give up that life of trying and trying and just live the life of being. Yeah. Just be. You've already made it. Why? Because you made it through Christ. Through Christ. Verse 22, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So once you believe, you receive the faith. After you receive the faith, guess what you do? You gain understanding. What's understanding? You put it under you so you can stand on it. That's what understanding is. You know why God says in all you're getting, get understanding? Because he wants you to understand and stand on the platform of what Christ did for you. You know why Christ said that you can do greater things than he did? Because you're standing on his accomplishments. You don't have to accomplish what he already accomplished. One of the reasons that I'm learning to read books 
and books that are written by men and women that I know they've poured their life into because in 100 to 300 pages I can read what took that person a lifetime to learn and then I could stand on their accomplishment. My son, I send him to school so I can put him on my shoulders so that he can see further than I could see so he could understand greater things than I understand and I want him to stand on what his father has accomplished. That's all your Heavenly Father wants for you. Grace permits you to stand on the shoulders of Jesus' accomplishments. And so remember, understanding, you put it under you, and you get to stand on it. See, because once you stand on it, you know. You go from believing to knowing. I know this platform's going to hold me up. Why? Because I already stood on it. I've already tested out. I watched a couple of the singers bouncing back and forth on it. said, well, you know what? If they didn't go down, I'm not going down either. If it's holding this, probably hold me as well. When you stand on the accomplishments of what Christ has done, you are truly living out grace. Hallelujah. We couldn't do it. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. And then he empowered you to live in that fulfillment. Man, this is good. If I wasn't saved, I'd get saved. I'm telling you right now. I, I'd get saved. So this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. Anybody ever have a grapefruit? I love grapefruit. Anybody else? Did you know that the grapefruit didn't exist? But you know what someone did intelligently? They grafted two trees together and produced a new fruit that didn't exist. You know what the Father did with the Jews and the Gentiles? Through Christ, he grafted together two different peoples and he started a new species, a born-again species. That's what we are. Now, I don't want anybody walking around, I'm a grapefruit. Pastor preached it from the pulpit, it must be. I just want you to understand something. You are a new species. You did not exist before. When you were born again in Christ, that new creation, that new being is literally a new species. That's why we walk in power that we didn't have before when we weren't saved. The reason you walk in power now is because in your new nature, you have a power that you didn't have before. But do not try to accomplish those things again that you used to have to do because now you accomplish what Jesus has already done. Amen? Amen? Everybody got that? I don't have to repeat it again? Y'all sure? I asked God one time, what are there four Gospels? He says, I have to repeat sometimes. They don't get it the first time. <laughs> I said, okay, Lord, got that one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love this. For all have sinned and fallen short or fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. How did you get there? By the redemption that came through Christ Jesus to redeem to bring back into his fold, to restore back to original design before Adam and Eve sinned. I said, man, I would have loved to have been Adam, that whole garden. You got better than Adam. You got the last Adam. And the last Adam lives in you. And guess what? That one can't be corrupted by sin. Please settle this in your hearts. There is no way that corruption can reach any of you because of the fact that the last Adam, being Jesus Christ, has taken away the requirement of the law. And now the only thing that should exist in you is the law of life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So I want to end this teaching right here. And then I want to go quickly into a teaching only because so many people are asking me about healing. 
They're asking me about healing. They're asking me about healing. They're asking me about healing. So I want to teach you the pattern of healing in the Bible. I'm going to quote some verses. You'll have to look them up later. I'm going to talk about a story. You'll have to look it up later. Um, I have my Bible, and all this stuff is marked in my Bible. But right now, for the sake of time, because it's going to be 12 o'clock, I'm going to do this quickly. And I'm going to do this because my people perish from a lack of knowledge. I want to give you knowledge so you don't perish by disease. You don't perish by sickness. If I were to display for you some of the miracles that we have seen, some of you, your jaw would drop. We had a guy whose leg grew out three inches. His knee was actually up here. And so when, when we prayed, his, his leg had to go from here, grow down, so both knees were lined up. Wonderful. That was amazing. I give God the glory. Yeah. There was a young man this year. I went back to Mexico. A couple of years earlier, God had healed a man who was blind. So I was praying for people. I came across a guy. He happened to be mute. And so I said, does anybody know his name? And the lady over here said, su nombre es David. His name is David. And I said, okay. I said, how long has he been without speaking? She says, he was born mute. I said, okay. So you know what I did? I said, Father, what is it? I didn't start praying for him. I said, Father, what is it? And the Lord told me, it's a mute spirit. And I said, oh, okay. Because guess what? At the name of Jesus, that mute spirit had to go. Had to take his mute self and all his cousins and he had to leave. <laughs> Prayed for him. I said, mute spirit, I command you in Jesus' name, get out of this body now. And then I said, speak. And he goes like this. And he pointed. I said, what is your, como te llamas? What is your name? And he went, Abid. Yeah. Mother started weeping uncontrollably. You know what was the awesome thing? Because he didn't speak, he hadn't brushed his teeth. When he showed up Sunday at church, his teeth were all brushed. He had a smile. You can slap that smile off that boy's face. You know why? Because for the first time, the thing that had caused him the greatest shame was now gone. Listen to me. God doesn't heal some of the time. God is healing. It just exudes out of him. Guys, we've read that scripture where Jesus went to his own town and he could barely do a miracle. Do you think that their unbelief stopped Jesus from doing miracles? That's not what that scripture is saying. What happened was that in those days, these small homes... They would take out the sick and put them outside as Jesus walked by and healed them. But because of their unbelief, they left the sick at home. But the few that did believe and brought the sick out, those Jesus was able to heal. You're not stopping Jesus from healing. The, when I first started to minister and I got a chance to go around a little bit with Todd White, one of the things that we learned is the person getting the healing doesn't have to believe at all. In one of the teachings that he did, he says, how do you think Muslims get healed when I pray for them? They don't even believe in the name of Jesus. He walked down Jerusalem, the streets, healing everybody he came across. Those Jews don't believe in Christ. How did they get healed? Christ in you. How did the little boy that was dead when he seen mama crying? And Jesus knew why she was crying because her husband had died. And see, in those days, the male represented the income. That mother was crying because her only male had died. That was the end of their income. He walks by, what does Jesus do? He taps the coffin. How much believing did the dead guy do? <laughs> Listen to me. If you believe wrong, you'll receive wrong. Here's what God said to me one day. If you believe that I don't heal, you're right. If you believe that I heal, you're right. Because you are going to experience what you believe. As a Christian, we are required to believe right. The reason that when I had received a disease called myasthenia gravis, God did not heal it immediately was because I was asking him for something that was already mine. And I didn't know that. Father, heal me. Father, heal me. And so he told me, where did you see that pattern in Jesus? Jesus never prayed for me to heal anybody. He went out and healed them. So that's when I reversed my prayer. Instead of asking God to heal my disease, 
I used to tell God about the bigness of my disease. Then I started to tell the disease about the bigness of my God. And guess what happened? The disease had to leave. It was like, oh no. The Bible says if the enemy is found out, he has to flee. If he's not found out, he don't have to go anywhere. It's only when he's found out that he has to leave. And let me tell you, he leaves quickly. He leaves quickly. Like a roach when you turn on the light in the kitchen. Man, they just scatter. I've seen the devil scatter so fast, it's amazing. Because the light of Christ in me did what the light in the kitchen did. Those roaches just took off when he was found out. So here is the teaching that I'm going to give, and I'll give it quickly. There is a pattern. If I wanted to make a shirt the, like the one Pastor Rob's wearing, what do I need to make an identical shirt like that? I need a pattern. And with the pattern, I can make thousands of shirts like that. So when you understand that God works in patterns, then you understand how to be healed. What is the pattern? The pattern is that the root of all sickness is sin. So in order for God to heal, he would have to remove sin out of the way to take care of the sickness. So the Holy Spirit sat me down and said to me, because now you have been healed, I'm going to teach you the pattern of how I heal. So that when you're praying for people, you understand what I'm doing. And all you're getting, get understanding. Why? So that you can put it under you and stand on it. Here's the pattern. We read it, she read it earlier. Out of Isaiah 53, what does it say? It says that he took care of all of our iniquities... And then what? And then by his stripes we are healed. And you're right. There the word is are. The word in, in um, 1 Peter 2.24 is we were healed. But Jesus hadn't died yet physically. So notice what's the pattern? Takes care of the iniquity. And then does what? Heals all our diseases. Now let's go over to Psalm 103, verse 1. You know what I love about this psalm? He's talking to himself. You know, David strengthened himself in the Lord. David knew how to talk to his unbelieving self. I love that. I love that. We call that today a lunatic, right? You see a guy talking to himself, we kind of walk around him, right? But David was constantly talking to himself. And look what he says here. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. He's not talking to his spirit, he's talking to his soul. His mind, his will, his emotions. He is talking to that, and he's saying, bless the Lord. What does the next verse say? Apparently, we didn't only need four Gospels. He needed to repeat it to himself again. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What are we looking for? We're looking for a pattern. Go to the next verse. Who forgives, there's the pattern, he's removing the sin out first. Who forgives all of your iniquities, and then who brings healing to all of your diseases. What's the pattern? Sin goes out first, and then the disease is healed. Now we have a story of four buddies that want to get the, their friend to see Jesus. And they got there and there was a crowd. But I don't know if you've ever been to Israel. These houses were really small. And some of these houses were by mountainsides, so they climbed up came over and they made a hole in the roof. And they start to bring their buddy down. And guess what happens? Jesus sees, and what's the first thing Jesus says to this young man? Your sins have been forgiven you. What do we have? A pattern. He forgave his sin. Then after he forgave his sin, he told all the unbelievers, so that you know that I have the authority to forgive sin, now he healed them. Pick up your bed and walk. Guys, the reason that we get healed today is that Jesus has fully removed the sin. Sickness doesn't have a leg to stand on. So you know what sickness does? It comes illegally into your body to see if you'll allow it. Most Christians fail their, their, their healing on the second symptom. They'll come to church, they'll get healed. And then they'll get to the car, and the sy symptom will try to come back. And if they go, oh, it didn't work, Satan goes, I got it. I needed that word, that technical word to hang on to. If the first thing that comes out of their mouth, oh, it really didn't work, it's over. Yeah. 
because you just gave that sickness permission to walk back in. Your sin of unbelief gave life to that sickness. Oh, the blood didn't work for me. That's all Satan needs because he doesn't have a leg to stand on. But if you give him unbelief, if you give him an accusation against the blood of Christ, that he can hang on to. If you get the symptom back after you're healed, don't say, oh man, what happened? Say, oh, look at this stupid symptom. <laughs> Thinks it could stay in a healed body. Go. Guess what he is? Oh. It says that when Satan tempted Jesus, it said in due season, he would come back. Guys, that story wasn't written in there for us to read a story about how Jesus overcame Satan. That story was put in there for one reason and one reason only. So we would understand that Satan is going to come back in due season to see if you still believe what you believe. Because the power of life and death is in your tongue. Satan needs your permission to bring you death. He needs your permission to take you out. That's why he wants you to never forgive someone who's really deeply hurt you. Because that root of bitterness becomes his permission to come in and disease your body. So where's the pattern again? And this is the last place that I found the pattern. And I loved it. Because this was the place that I understood full payment for sin. Let's go to 1 Peter 2.24. If you can put that up there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. And then after this, I'm expecting that you guys will understand. And this is the shortest that I've given this message. But again, the idea is that you guys understand that there's a pattern in the Word. And when you understand the pattern, you know you have the right. As a child of God, healing is the children's bread. It's your bread. It's your bread. I don't know about you. When I go to a restaurant, I'm looking for the bread. I love bread. I love bread. When I get up in the morning, I like bread. I like it with butter. I like it with jam. I just love bread. Found out that healing was the children's bread. But here's what it says. Who his own self. How does Jesus know you? Because he took your sicknesses, your sin, and your salvation on his own body. In his own body. Who in his own self? What did he do? He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. God said, it's important, Alex, you have to understand it was a tree. Sin came through a tree. Sin left through a tree. Amen. It's gone. Good. It's gone. It don't exist anymore. You know, when you repeatedly confess your sins for God to forgive you, he has no clue what you're talking about. He has no clue. Do you know why? Because Christ took your penalty of sin on that tree, that we being dead to sins. When I first read this, I said, God, I got to be real with you. I still commit sins. He goes, you commit sins, but no longer as a slave to sin, you commit sins by choice. And those sins you're dead to. They have no control over you. They have no control over you. That's why you're dead to sin. He told me, let me explain it to you in a way that you'll understand it. If somebody came and paid off your mortgage and you got a mortgage bill the next month, would you pay it? Of course not. Why? Because I'm dead to that debt. Do you understand that you are dead to the debt of sin? Yes. Why did Christ do that? Why did he wipe it out completely? It tells us in Colossians that he completely wiped out the debt. Why did he do that? For the next reason. See, because this is what he wanted to do next. It says that we being dead to sin. Oh, there we go. Being dead to sin should live unto what? Righteousness. What is righteousness? It's being made right with God and having the rights of God. It's the process of adoption into a holy family where you've been born again and your born again spirit is now sitting with Christ in heavenly places. That's righteousness. You've been made right with God and you have all the rights of God. It's the process of adoption. If I were to adopt a child, that child would carry my name. He would have rights in my will. He would have rights in my refrigerator. He would have rights to do whatever he wanted in my house because he was adopted in. Now look at what it says next. 
by whose stripes you were healed. That's the last part of that verse. By his stripes you were healed. It's past tense. When I pray for the sick, I'm not praying for God to heal them. Now, I'm praying for the healed work that already happened. Bad grammar, but good theology. When you need something and it already were there. You know, Trisha talked about that that expectancy causes us to be in joy now for something that's coming. Now, I used to give this example. I haven't given it a while, so I'm going to give it again. You ladies that go shopping with your girlfriend, all right? And your girlfriend knows what kind of shoes you like. And one day your girlfriend is in the mall and she's walking by your favorite store and she sees your favorite shoes on sale. And your girlfriend picks up the phone and says, hey, honey, guess what? I see your shoes are on sale. And you know what? Because I love you so much, I'm going to go ahead and buy them for you. I'll see you in about half an hour. And she clicks the phone. And you know what you're doing? In the kitchen, you're doing the crazy dance. You're like, woo! There come my shoes, there come my shoes. And half an hour later, you hear ding dong. Now you are rejoicing before you see the promise of the delivery because you trust the voice of the one that made the promise. How much greater is the voice of a God that cannot lie when he says you were healed. You should be rejoicing. I don't care if the symptom is still there. You should be rejoicing because the one that made the promise got rid of it already. He cannot lie. Amen. And you all know when that girlfriend showed up, you're not even looking at her face. You're looking which hand is holding the bag. You're greeting her by looking at her hands. Ding, ding. You'd open the door like, oh my goodness. You're not even looking at her face. You're looking at the gift because you believe the one that made the promise. If a human could buy something that you like and enjoy and bring it to you because they love you, what do you think the Father has done when he purchased for you healing at the cross? Man, it's yours. Stop doubting him. Just stop doubting and start receiving. You know, Trisha said it earlier, we just have to receive. You just got to be receivers. If you're a quarterback and you're looking for, for your guy running out there, what are you looking for? For your receiver. And you know what he, what he needs to do? He needs to have his hands out or he can fumble the ball. Would you just be the receivers today yeah. of that healing? So I'm done with that teaching. Thank God it only took 15 minutes. But really, I want you guys to be aware. Believe him, just like you believe that friend that would be bringing something to you that they would know that you enjoy. Please, he's worthy to be believed. He's worthy to be glorified. He's worthy to be the only voice that you hear. He's worthy. Amen? Amen. God bless you.